Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Sure. Really got to test my pipes tonight. We are almost at full capacity, so uh, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight uh, for the next edition of our guest speaker series. Uh, this is a program that we started six years ago now. Um, and uh, we've been bringing in local presenters from near and far. But uh, tonight we're very happy to have Mr. David Kinney with us today to talk about Horseshoe Lake. Uh, and for anyone who isn't aware, he did write a book. And we do have it in the gift shop. So uh, if you are interested, you can take care of that after the show. And I'm sure he'll be happy to sign it and make it a very valuable copy after. <laughs> So without further ado, David, you can come on up. Well, thank you very much. Brian, thank you very much for the, wow, that's loud. <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction. I really do appreciate it. This is a great crowd. Looks like, uh, you know, uh, have a, a lot of friendly faces here, and I'm, I'm really happy to see you all. My name is Dave Kinney, and I did write a book called The History of Portia Lake in Stafford, New York. And this is my first book and my first presentation, so your right. indulgence is appreciated. <laughs> um, I wanted to get started uh, quickly and answer a question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind. And that question is, <laughs> did somebody at some point at Horseshoe Lake hire a roller skating bear <laughs> to bring in the local, the local community so just so they could fleece them for two bits? And the answer is, you bet they did. In 1912, a baby Jack, the roller skating bear, appeared in a horseshoe lake. And who was the opening act for Baby Jack the Roller Skating Bear? The Wee Scotch Lassies, the world's youngest roller skaters. The world's youngest. And later on in the day, you could actually see the bear wrestle a man. And so in all the newspaper accounts of this event was that it was very well attended and enjoyed and enjoyed by all. I wanted to quickly talk to you about uh, Charles Hodges. Charles Hodges is the man who brought you attractions like this. He was the guy who really took everything to a, a new level. He was a, a disciple of P.T. Barnum, uh, the greatest show on earth, the man who coined the phrase, never give a sucker even brain. And Charles Hodges uh, owned, owned the lake, and he took that to a whole, whole new level for Western, Western New York. And what did P.T. Barnum feature in his greatest show on earth? Of course, came back. <laughs> so Horseshoe Lake is a very small lake. It's a privately owned, spring-fed um, lake here, about four miles from this spot. And it's been there for really quite, quite a long time. It's a beautiful location. It's, um, there's a lot of wildlife there. It's great for, um, for swimming, boating, uh, for fishing especially. And uh, um, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful spot. Uh, I haven't been there for very long, but uh, my wife, Julie, back there, who uh, her family has been in Horseshoe Lake for over 40 years, and when it came time for me to retire, we, after many, many discussions, we decided that we would retire to Horseshoe Lake, and since I hate the winter, we go away in the wintertime. But, uh, so, I spent about 45 years or so in the information technology business, and I was born and raised in the Washington, D.C. area. I've been very lucky in my career. I was able to travel all over the United States, to Asia many times, to Europe many times, to Africa many times as part of my job. And uh, so living at Horseshoe Lake and retiring at such a small, quiet community, uh, cottage community, has been <coughs> like living on another planet in many, in many ways for me. So I'm kind of the outsider looking in. And so because we moved here, and I didn't have anything to do but drink scotch and smoke cigars, the, uh, I decided to look into the history of the area. So I'm living here. I might as well learn a little bit about it. And so I did find that there was a, a five different histories written, some of which are Horseshoe Lake specific, and some of them are about the Stafford community in general that mention Horseshoe Lake. And, so, and most of them are not very long at all. And in reading all of these, there was a similar narrative that came through all of them. And as a matter of fact, they were repeating many of the same data points. And that combined narrative here is that Bigelow Creek was 40 feet wide and owned by a guy named um, uh, Charles Snell. Robert Fisher showed up from England in 1831 
and he sold $60,000 worth of stock to the local farmers. He went on to buy the Morganville Mill that year, and then that wasn't enough. He built a small mill on Bigelow Creek, dammed up the Bigelow Creek, and created Fisher's, Fisher's Pond. At this point, all the mills failed, and everybody lost all their money. And so that's the narrative that was presented by the historians that had come before me. And the truth of the matter was, I didn't believe a word of it. So when I look at history, I try to look through a lens that, uh, you know, of that time period. So I'm looking through like a early 19th century lens at this, at, at this explanation, and what I'm seeing is that there is um, a bunch of Stafford farmers, and so this is a very agrarian community. It's just a farm farming community. These people are working, you know, from sun up to sundown. You know, this is part of the American frontier at this point. They are plowing their fields, they're planting their crops, they're trying to get their crops in, trying to get their crops to market. They're probably using a plow just like this over here, you know, dragging something like this behind a couple of horses all day long and, um, and working very, very hard. At this point in America's history, the American Revolution had really only been over less than 50 years, and there would have been people that knew folks that were involved in the American Revolution, certainly people that had relatives, uh, that were involved in the American Re Revolution. The Constitution of the United States had just been ratified really less than about 40 years prior to this, and the community of Stafford was really only 11 years old. And so when I take a look at this, I think, okay, well, so an Englishman shows up, and he goes to the farmers, and he says, hey, give me $60,000. Now, $60,000 in 1831, that's over $2 million in, in today, today's money. The farmers, of course, say, sure, here's the money. And so this Englishman, he turns around, he buys the largest going concern in the area, the Morganville Mill. And then he turns around in that same year, he dams up Big Little Creek, he builds another small mill, and this is what it might have looked like. This is, we had no pictures or drawings of the, the mill itself, but this is kind of a period representation of what a mill, a small mill on a small lake like this might, might look like. So I'm at the point now where I want to talk a little bit about the Morganville Mill. Now this picture is actually the rebuilt Morganville Mill. It was a stone structure originally. You can still, still, still see on the left-hand side the stone wall that, that was left there. And uh, the original mill burned and they rebuilt it this way. And if you go over to the spot where this mill was, it's on private property. You have to get permission to go, go there. But it's actually a very beautiful spot. There's about a 30-foot drop-off there. It's a perfect place for a, for a mill. And so now I'm here. <laughs> so, so now I'm here, and I'm trying to think to myself, now what? I've read, the, I've read the histories, I'm trying to figure out what's going on, I don't believe a word of it, and so I decide that I'm going to try to get to the bottom of this. And so, I, as an old IT guy, I try to gather tools together to do this. And so I've got genealogy tools, I've got the federal census, I've got the New York census, and all the information that's online there. There's some fabulous museums in the area. There's some wonderful libraries in the area. Uh, I've got old newspapers, and I guess, of course I have the county clerk's office with all the deeds and all the contracts forever um, at, at my disposal. And so I make a list of questions that I need to get answered because I don't believe anything that I've read to, to this point. And the first question, did Robert Fisher arrive from England in 1831? And so I'm doing a lot of reading, and I find out that 1830 was really the beginning of a great migration of people from England uh, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales to the United States. And so it's understandable. England's been around for centuries. All the land's been bought. All the stores have been opened. All the cities are settled. And none of that is true in America. And so if you're looking for economic opportunity, the only opportunity you have if you stay in England is to go work for somebody else. And so people started coming to America. So Robert Fisher might have been one of those people. So we've got to look into him. We take a look at his genealogy. And there's nothing there. We've got his mother and father, birthday, maybe a christening day, a couple of data points, total dead end. If you're doing research, this is bad news. So I start digging a little bit more, find out, well, look at that. He got married. <laughs> he married a girl named Elizabeth Sidver Goody. And 
lucky for me, Elizabeth was a member of one of those English families. You know, hundreds of years of history, hundreds of members of this family. Uh, this is great news because chances are with an old English family like this, a wealthy family, somebody was keeping track of who was doing what. And sure enough, there are other people out there doing, his, doing uh, research into the Goody family. And I contacted one of them, a woman called Glennis up in uh, Canada, and we started emailing back and forth, and I, th I told her what I was up to. I think she took pity on me. And uh, so she emailed me back, and she said, well, you know, there's a book. And there's a book of the Goody family history. And so from 1710 to, to 1954, um, you know, they had written really quite a bit of stuff down, and there's only two copies of this book. There's one in the Guelph, Ontario Library, which you can't access unless you're at the library itself, and she has the other one. Oh, yes. So, she starts, she scans a couple of pages, she sends me a couple of pages, she sends me a couple of more, she sends me a dozen pages, a dozen more, and all of a sudden my inbox is being flooded with scanned pages from this book. And so this is kind of the Eureka, the Eureka moment. Now, Elizabeth said for Goody, lucky for us, she kept a diary for at least part of her time. And so we know how she got to the U.S. And we, so, you know, we, we have a good idea for how she got there. But one of the passages in the book is that in 1834, two years after the family's arrival in Canada, at the age of 23, she married Mr. Robert Fisher of Guelph. So that puts Robert Fisher in Guelph, Ontario in 1834. And they, they get married. It goes on to say the Fishers made their home in Morganville, Genesee County, New York, where Robert was in the milling business. And so this is a fabulous moment, right? So we, so we, we, we actually place an individual at a specific spot at a specific time, which is kind of unusual. And so Elizabeth, when she actually came over, she spent 50 days at sea to get from England to Quebec City. From that point, she went from Quebec City, taking boats down the St. Lawrence Seaway, to Montreal, Cornwall, Kingston, through Toronto, across Lake Ontario to Toronto, and settled in Guelph. She stopped journaling at this point, and so I have no idea why she ended up in this little village called Guelph, Ontario, but that's where her and Robert Fisher met. At this point, <laughs> the, the happy couple, they, they moved to uh, Stafford, New York. And Robert gets a job right away. And so he's contracted by the Lathrop, Charles and Anne Gate Lathrop, to build a hotel in Stafford. And so that hotel is still standing today. We call it the Call Memorial Hall. And you can see where the Call Memorial Hall was built in 1834. And Robert, the story goes that Robert Fisher either built or helped build that hotel. So it puts him Johnny on the spot. And so, we have the question, did Robert Fisher arrive from England in 1831? And the answer is no, he arrived in 1834. The next question I wanted to answer was, did Robert Fisher buy the Morganville Mill from Abgate Lathrop? And so, the answer to that, of course, is that the answer is no, he didn't. The, um, I looked through all of the deeds, and there are no transactions whatsoever between Abgate Lathrop and Robert Fisher. So that part of the story was clearly not true. But what is true is that Adam Gates did sell the mill in 1831 to a guy named David Rogers, who was buying and selling and parceling out land at the time. In 1832, he sold it to Charles English, and Robert Fisher did buy the mill in 1835. Hmm. The next question I'm trying to get answered is, did Robert Fisher buy the Bigelow Creek property from Charlie Snell? And looking into this, there are no, Charles Snell did not exist in this location. Charles, I looked into his genealogy, Charles Snell was born and raised in Connecticut, and he migrated to, um, to Genesee County in the 1850s. He lived in Pembroke. And he did take part in a lot of different real estate transactions, but there was never any record of him ever owning this land, or possessing it, or transferring it to Robert Fisher. And so this is all trying to figure out what the local history is all about. So now, did Robert Fisher go to the farmers, raise $60,000 from the farmers, and uh, all of the endeavors that he undertook fail, and everybody loses their money. So I looked high and low, trying to find any evidence that this is true. I'm looking in newspapers, I'm looking at classified ads, I'm looking through contracts in the clerk's office, I'm looking all over the place, and I can find absolutely no evidence that this ever occurred 
in any way. But what I did find was a, tr a tremendous trail of borrowing that Robert Fisher did. So either he paid cash for whatever he did, and there's many deeds out there for what, you know, what he was buying. He was buying water rights, he was buying easements on properties to make waterways to, for, for his businesses and things like that. And, but he borrowed the money for people whenever he needed to do something or he paid cash. And so he borrowed as much as $6,800, which is about a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. So this whole $60,000 thing, I don't know where it came from, but it's just simply not true. So did Robert Fisher dam up Bigelow Creek, build a grist mill in 1831 and form Fisher's Pond? The answer, of course, is yes and no. We know that he wasn't here in 1831, but he did build the mill at Bigelow Creek and form Fisher's Pond. We can tell this just by looking at the local maps. In 1839, Genesee County, if we, take, we orient ourselves, here's Batavia, and here's Stafford. We take a look at where Fisher's Pond and Horseshoe Lake ought to be, what we find out is that there's no body of water there in 1839. We take a look at the 1854 map, and here's Stafford, and here's where Horseshoe Lake or Fisher's Pond ought to be, and there it is. Fisher's Grist Mill with the pond right on the other side of the road here. So we know that the Horseshoe Lake Grist Mill and the pond were built between 1839 and 1854, just by looking at the map. Again, I come to the crossroads. So I've learned the history, and I feel like I've disproved the history. I found out it's, it's inaccurate. And so what do I do now? I try to figure out what really happened. And so this is where I kind of started thinking about <laughs> writing it all down. Because I'm for, for, at this point, I'm doing it kind of for myself. And so we know that the happy couple migrated to Morganville in 1834, and we, we have Stafford here, and we know that Robert Fisher purchases the Morganville Mill from Charles English in 1835. We also know that he bought a second mill in Roanoke, down uh, in the southern tip of Stafford, in 1843, and you can see right on the map, R. Fisher, you know, so that's where, where the grist mill was in Roanoke in 1843. And we also know now that Robert Fisher builds and opens what he calls the new mill on Bigelow Creek, in 1849. Well, I just said it was between 1839 and 1854. How do we know it was 1849? We go back to the good book of Good Eve. <laughs> and one of the marvelous things about this book is that they kept all the family letters. Wow. So the communications going back and forth between the Americans and the Canadians and the Brits, and you know, anytime somebody dies, anytime somebody gets married, a child is born, anything that's happened, any kind of business that's going on uh, is, is actually contained in these letters. And so reading through this, we find out that Robert Fisher actually employed his brother-in-law, Edward, from 1849 to 1851. Edward was a big writer. And Edward wrote, Mr. Fisher intends to operate three mills in the fall. And so we know that he's built a mill and he's getting ready to go into production for the harvest of 1849. And that's when the bill was built in, on Bigelow Creek. He also writes, I'm sorry, I've got to read this. In addition to the home mill, which is the Morganville mill, Robert has the Roanoke mill, which has answered his expectations, and the new mill, which has proved a complete failure owing to lack of water. And so this may be the, the, the core, the kernel, of, or the seed of the failure, the $60,000 failure uh, um, history that was writ written previously, although I'm not really sure about it. It's a fairly obscure passage. But in any case, Robert Fisher has a problem. And so I'm trying to, I try to construct a timeline for the grist mill here. And so I think that he starts building the grist mill in 1848. So let's face it, he's got two other mills to run. He's got to get permission to, get, to do this. He's got to get the materials. He's got to clear the land. He's got to get a crew. He's got to build the mill. And you know, and, and uh, get everything into operation, and build a dam, get everything into operation, and he's still running two other businesses at the same time. So I think that by 1849, when he gets the harvest in, and he finds out he's got a water problem, it's 1850 now. By the time he's really thinking, I have an urgent business issue here. I have a mill. I've invested a lot of time, a lot of money into this, and I don't have enough water to turn the weight. And so he decides that he's going to build a dam, he's going to try to increase the water pressure, and I think he probably starts getting that done in 1851. 
and I think he's in full production in 1852. And I think this is the timeline for the, or roughly the timeline for the Grisville at Horseshoe Lake. I don't think that you could get this work done today in that period of time. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit about the milling business. And there's a whole lot of phrases that we actually use today that, that came from the milling business. For instance, keeping your nose to the grindstone. You know, we tell our kids that all the time. You're doing your homework, keep your nose to the grindstone. But that, what that really means is that in the milling business, you have these two stones that are rubbing together with grooves in them that are grinding the flour. If the stones are too close together, the friction gets to be too great and it burns the flour. The burning flour makes a particular smell. And so keeping your nose to the grindstone is actually a miller monitoring his, the, the level of his grindstone. Also, the flour can catch on fire and the grist mill can burn to the ground, which happened to an awful lot of grist mills at the, at the time. It's all grist for the mill. All right, so whenever we're gossiping about somebody and we're talking about everybody's lives, it's all grist for the mill. When things come to a grinding halt, the two, the two um, uh, platters come together, they get too close together, the mill just locks up and stops and things come to a grinding halt. That's where that comes from. Fair to milling. Now, fair to milling, now there are three um, uh, qualities of flour. There is fair, there's middling or middling, which is just another name for middle, and there's good. And so those are the three grades of flour. Fair to middling means it's not your best work. When somebody gets put through the mill, we say that all the time. You see somebody that's all stressed out, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're having a lot of trouble, they're all frazzled, and everything like that, they've been put through the mill. And the rule of thumb. And so when the miller was grinding the flour, he would pick up some flour, he would rub it between his thumb and his fingers, and if it was too coarse, he knew that he had to mill that flour again. And that's the rule of thumb. Mm, interesting. interesting. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about horseshoe leg trivia. The property says Robert Fisher was there. The property has changed hands 20 times. There have been 17 unique owners of the property, which means that three of those owners own the property twice. The shortest ownership was one week. And so the person who bought the property died while the transaction was actually happening. <laughs> the longest is 53 years, and that's the current run for, uh, for the Horseshoe Lake Corporation, and that it's been called by 13 different names in its history. You know? So in about 170 years, there's been about 13 different names. So Fisher's Pond, of course, the original name of it, named after Robert Fisher, but it became the West Mill Pond, the West Mill, the West Mill Grove, the Old Moss Flowering Mill, Buell Lake, Hodges Ocean, the uh, Genesee Assembly Grounds, Coney Island of Western New York, the Horseshoe Lake Amusement Park, and then of course three different versions of Horseshoe Lake. <laughs> I want to talk for a couple of minutes about some of the owners, not all the owners, but a couple of them that, 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 and some of their significant contributions. The first one is a guy named John Lintz, and he owned the property for about uh, five years here. And his biggest contribution was that he was responsible for Horseshoe Lake's identity crisis. He, we, he would run ads all the time, and he would interchange the names Fisher's Pond, West Mill Pond, West Mill Grove, The Grove, and nobody could figure out what to call this place. The press was confused, the public was confused. He also did build the first dance hall there, and oddly it had a canvas-covered dance floor. Have you ever heard of cancer canvas-covered dance What's the purpose of the canvas? I don't get it. I couldn't Yeah, so, the, um, uh, so anyway, he also raised the level of the lake for the first time and actually created the first formation of, of the island, the hill, the hill in the middle. He sold it to Edward Buell, and Edward Buell, he wanted to resolve the identity crisis completely, and so he renamed it to Buell Lake. Nobody cared. The press still called it Fisher's Pond. They sometimes called it the Old Moss Flouring Mill. Nobody, nobody, his name just didn't stick. He owned it for about two years. He rebuilt the dance hall, and he managed to burn down the grist mill. <laughs> so that was his contribution. To like, and actually, he left. He sold the link, and he left, and he went to work with these guys right here, the Ian Rowell, uh, uh, the vice president for their company. That's what he, what he did when he left, left the link. So when he watched this guy, we talked about him a little bit before Charles Hodges. And Charles Hodges, he wanted 
the lake. He wanted to buy Buell Lake bad. And, but him and uh, Buell could not get it together. They, I don't know if the price wasn't right or if they just didn't like each other. I don't know what the problem was, but they could not make a deal. And so what we learned about Charles Hines is that he's a real Buell dealer. He's doing real estate transactions all over the place. He's what you would call a house flipper today. So he's buying and selling farms and houses and vacant lots and properties all over the place. And there's even one article that features him that he bought and sold the same property three times in one year and made a profit every time. Yeah. Un unbelievable. <laughs> he had a partner for these transactions, a real estate broker and insurance broker named Charles Snell. And Charles Snell had a daughter. Her name was Nettie, and she married a real low life named Duncan McPherson. <laughs> And Duncan, and so Charlie Hodges would have known Duncan McPherson. Charlie Hodges couldn't get a hold of Buell Lake, but Duncan could. And so I think, backed by his father-in-law and Charles Hodges, Duncan McPherson buys Buell Lake in 1889. He um, only owns the lake for six months, and he is the one, I don't know if he, he was the one who coined the phrase Horseshoe Lake. However, it's possible because he might have been backed by Charles Hodges that he was kind of the Wizard of Oz. He was behind the curtain pulling the strings. So it may have been Hodges that actually was responsible for the renaming of the lake. But about six months later, Hodges finds himself in possession of a property, a farm that's worth about $5,500. Duncan McPherson paid $3,800 for Buell Lake. He now buys it at $4,500 six months later, and they swap properties. So now Charles Hodges is the owner of Horseshoe Lake. So I think there might have been a little bit of behind the scenes dealing going on there, but that's how he came into possession of the lake. And so Charles Hodges, he was an interesting guy. He owned the lake for 37 years. And so he was a local guy. He was a, from humble beginnings, a from, uh, raised on a farm in, in Byron. He was a born entrepreneur. He was one of those guys. He could sell snow to the Eskimos. He was, he was a, a real talker. He loved horses and he loved money. It's hard to tell which one he loved more. He was also made, and so and this was the time when the Gilded Age was kind of going on, right? And so, you know, there was a lot of wealth. There was a lot of industrialization. And I think he really wanted to be a part of this. He married a, a very wealthy Stafford girl named Amy, uh, Harry, Amy Harriet Vallette. And the Vallettes were large property owners in the area there in the, uh, the Gazette, the Gazette and the, the highly well featured. He was flipping properties all over the place at this point and actually the deeds for the properties, when you take a look, close look at them, it always says Charles Hodges and one. And that one is Amy. And that's where the money, the money was coming from. And as I mentioned, he was a de devotee of P.T. Barnum. And so up until this point, Buell Lake or Fisher Pond or Horseshoe Lake, whatever you want to call it at this point, had been run as though it was kind of a recreation area. You could go on a picnic, there was a grove, the hill was all a grove for, for, for picnic tables, had swings on it. You could go for a nice swim, you could rent a boat, do a little fishing. It was a very nice location for, for people to come to and while away the hours on a summer afternoon. Char Charlie Hodges didn't have any intention of going that route. He was a devotee of P.T. Barnum. He changed his name to C.O. Hodges, just like P.T. Barnum. And he decided he was going to run this thing like it was a resort. And so he brought in, and so this is what Horseshoe Lake looks like about now. So it's, it's taken on its, its horseshoe shape, the eye in there, and you can see where Charles Hodges owns the whole shoot match at this point. You know, he has both lots one and two. He has, he has everything that surrounds Horseshoe Lake. He's going to go the route of P.T. Barnum. So he builds a croquet court. He builds a lawn tennis court. He builds a baseball diamond. There would have been a baseball game there every weekend during, during the summertime. He built a stable that could house 100 horses. There would be a band playing up in the picnic groves every day, especially on the weekends. They, would even, they might even be over on the shore. They would certainly be in the dance hall in the afternoon and in the evening. He even had a water-powered merry-go-round. Don't ask me how that worked. I don't have a clue how that, that may have worked. He also brought in attractions. He had jugglers. He had acrobats. 
he, had, he would stretch a rope across the lake and so he had a high wire act. He would have had trapeze artists come in. And of course, the aforementioned At this time in history, there was a national movement that was taking place, and it was called the Temperance Movement. And this is kind of the precursor to Prohibition. And so the temperance folks, alcohol is becoming a huge problem in society. And so the temperance folks really, they really wanted to ban alcohol, but they were really preaching to moderation of alcohol and, you know, and the getting rid of all the evil in society. This was actually big business. P.T. Barnum was a temperance lecturer. And he even produced a play called The Drunkard at the time. And so he was taking advantage of the temperance movement, cashing in on that. And so in walks a guy named Joseph Hess. Joseph Hess is a, he calls himself a reformed pugilist or a, um, a converted um, barkeep. Right? And so he writes a book, he goes on the circuit, he's out there temperance lecture, lecturing, and he meets C.O. Hodges. C.O. Hodges and him get together, and they start to talk about how they could take advantage of Horseshoe Lake and the temperance movement. And so Hess is going to go ahead and make a contract with Hodges for five years to do temperance lecturing at, the, at, the, uh, at Horseshoe Lake. And so Hodges builds an amphitheater at Horseshoe Lake for simply this. And so he, there's, uh, on the, um, the, south, the southwest portion of the island, there's, a, there's a, a steep hill there. And he put a platform at the bottom of that hill and with a podium on it. And there was going to be seats for 1,000 people on that hillside. But that was reduced to 500 people a couple of days later uh, in, in a separate <laughs> announcement. And actually, in the first year of the temperance lecturing, there would be as many as 400 people would show up for a temperance lecture. Now there would be a band playing, and so you'd pay whatever it was, and 25 cents or 50 cents, and you'd hear the, hear the music, and then somebody would come and they would tell you how to live your life. And uh, they would, <laughs> and, but like P.T. Barnum, Hodges knew that once you got the butts in the seats, once you got the people onto the property, that was, you had unlimited opportunities to sell them other goods and services. And so you could, you know, once the temperance lecture was over, you could sell them a cold lemonade. You could sell them a piece of cake. You could charge them to go swimming at the beach. You could rent them a rowboat for the afternoon. You could, they might get a ticket and go, go to the dance hall. And so this was P.T. Barnum's whole thing. And so if you're ever taking your kids to the circus, you know that buying the tickets is really just the first step. They're in your face trying to sell you stuff the entire time you're there. And so Joe Hess, he's actually lecturing around the country, and he calls Horseshoe Lake the Genesee Assembly Grounds. So that's where that odd name came from. Another attraction that was very popular in the Adirondacks and, and New England was the toboggan run, the roller toboggan run. And so have you ever seen like a picture of a manufacturing plant where the boxes move along uh, on, on the rollers, or there's somebody's unloading a truck and the, the boxes move down a, a string of rollers? This is just that on a huge scale. A bunch of wooden rollers formed to a slide. You would climb up the slide, somebody would hand you a board, and you would get on those rollers and you would slide down. Well, Horseshoe Lake like, had one. If we take a look at the 1914 picture of Horseshoe Lake, let's get oriented here real quick. We are on the, um, the, the northeast side of the island, and we're looking due north towards um, Horseshoe Lake Road. And so you can see, here's the hotel on this little hill over here. Here's the docks and where you would rent a rowboat. Over here is the dance hall. And down here in the corner, you can see the roller toboggan run. Now the roller toboggan run, the Horseshoe Lake, was 115 feet long and 35 feet high. It was built on the hill next to the, next to the beach. I don't know how much it costs to, to, to go down this hill, but if you take a real close look at this, look at the angle that it's coming down at. I mean, I think that you're going to pick up some speed on this 115-foot run, and I think you're going to. Uh, it looks like it's going to be very refreshing. <laughs> Another view of the lake is, um, is this uh, postcard from 1912, so sort of the same, same area. So to orient ourselves here, we're standing on Cedar Point, and we're looking towards the east, towards Horseshoe Lake Road. And you would still see the hotel here. 
you would see the, the robo rentals here, the dance hall here, and that is our. Oh, right 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 right. see that? This is the Horseshoe Lake uh, Sea View Pavilion, and then, uh, this is the one that Hodge has built. It's been rebuilt many, many times, but this is a picture from in the winter time when it's all closed down. And you can see it's actually a pretty good sized facility, and it acted as a dance hall and for, for games and things like that. Here's another, this is kind of the famous 1920s picture with the gazebo and the people milling about, the men in hats and the women in the long dresses. Another view of this is, uh, is this, and this looks like it might be some sort of straw hat convention that's going on. Ooh, it just happened. <coughs> ah, there we go. All right, and so what's interesting about this is that that path that's back there, that's East Lake Road. But that back then it was just a walking path. And look at the, look at the you know, I had always assumed that if you're going to build a ball field or a tennis court or something like that, that's where it would have been, but there's no evidence of it here, so I'm not sure where he actually put all of these things. It could have been across the road, but, but, uh, but then I, I always found that interesting. There's no vegetation in the farmer's field. In this postcard, so this is like a colorized picture, and so somebody has, you know, colorized this and drawn on it, and said, but this is, you know, there's probably several dozen cars there. People are always asking me, hey, where did they park? This is where they park. And uh, so that would have been a dirt road. There's a couple hundred people milling about, enjoying themselves. And if you happen to be standing here, and you looked across the lake, this is what you would see. And so you can see where the hillside is chopped down, almost cliff-like, and there are changing rooms and bathhouses the entire width of the beach. And in the center, there's a concession stand where you would pay for the use of the bathhouse or they per or permission to go swimming, or maybe they would sell you a lemonade, or, so or something like that. But that's what it looked like during that time period. Yeah, I'm not sure what that was for, but you can see the path that goes over the hill where people are walking, walking up there. And you know who I really like? I really like that lady. <laughs> right there. What a great time. If you, uh, if you were able to attend a dance, this is what the dance floor looked like on the inside of the pavilion. It's the only picture I've got. It's a terrible picture. Um, but if you look in the back, though, it's a 48-star flag. And so we started using the 48-star flag in 1912. Oh, you did? You, you went there? My mother. Oh, no kidding. Did she tell you any stories of it? When she was single, they all went. Oh, they all went? <laughs> Sounds like it was a, a good time could be had. <laughs> So anyway, so you know, if you ever imagine what the CPU pavilion on the inside looked like when they were having the dance, that's what it looked like. Now, Charlie Hodges, he brought a steamboat on the Horseshoe Lake, and if you've ever been to Horseshoe Lake, you know this is a small lake. The biggest boat on the lake is 15 feet long, it holds about six people comfortably. So he brings in a steamboat called the Elmira that will hold 35 people and take you on a 15 minute ride for a quarter. Right? And so this steamboat actually operated for about a dozen, dozen years of the lake. This is not a picture of the Elmira. Um, we don't have any pictures of, of the Elmira, but this is a, a period steamboat that was being operated on in the Adirondacks on some, um, some lakes up there. So I suspect that this is what the steamboat looked like. It's a very common model uh, for steamboats in the area. So 1923, oh no, a mysterious apparition is seen. It's ethereal, it's unapproachable, it's noiseless, it's luminous. Pleasure seekers are frightened. Visitors report the presence of a ghost, a real ghost in Batavia. Horseshoe Lake is said to have a ghost. It is, in fact, the ghost of Horseshoe Lake. And, and for two and a half weeks in, in July, uh, in 1923, this is all you would have heard. This was in the Daily News, this was in the Progressive Batavian, this was in the Leroy Gazette, this was in the newspapers in Rome, this was everywhere. There were close encounters reported almost daily in the, in the newspapers for the Horseshoe Lake. And so what was really going on here was that on Friday nights there would be a dance. When the band took a break, the patrons would steal the rowboats. They would take the rowboats out. Who knows what they were doing out on the lake in the, in the, in the night. But when the band started back up, they would just leave the rowboats wherever, and they would drift or drift around, and the staff would have to come in on Saturday morning, and they would have to go around and gather up all the rowboats, and they thought it was a real pain in the butt. And so what they did was they strung a wire across the lake, 
the cop got a couple of boards, a nightgown and a bell, and they put it on the wire. The wind would blow it around at night, and stealing a rowboat stopped. <laughs> People were too scared to go out on, out on the water. So for two and a half weeks, there was a ghost on Horseshoe Lake but that was um, actually set up by the maintenance workers at Horseshoe Lake. And the reason that the ghost evaporated was that it turned out it was scaring business away. People stopped coming to Horseshoe Lake altogether because it was haunting. In terms of Charlie Hodges, at some point decided to sell, and he sold it to a guy named Ed, Harry Pasternak. And Harry Pasternak owned the, the lake for a couple of years, and he was he started out really well. He assumed an eighteen thousand dollar mortgage in order to acquire the lake. He is a champion of the children of the area. He's got swimming lessons going on. He's got hiring lifeguards. He's got all kinds of safety programs going on, and he opens up the Horseshoe Lake Tavern. And as if he thought something bad was going to happen, he transfers the deed to his wife Bella. Not too long after that, we find out that Harry owned a pickle factory in town. So he was leasing two floors of a building in town, and one of the floors had a pickle factory on it. He was accused of um, operating an illegal distillery, using the pickle factory as a cover. So the police go over there, and they check it out, they look at and they look at the second floor, they don't find any distillery. The story goes, they never looked on the third floor. <laughs> Later on, we find out that Harry Pasternak is papering the town. He is passing bad checks all, all over the place. And then he gets arrested for hitting a woman over the head with a chair. And so this is a woman who owns a resort, a similar, a, a small resort called The Orchard, about a mile from Horseshoe Lake at the time. And I don't know what kind of argument they got into, but he beat her with a chair. She couldn't appear in court. She was injured so badly. She was in, in the hospital. He got out on bail. His wife posted the bail. And then the federal agents catch him smuggling liquor in the trunk of his car. So he's arrested for that. So things are not going well for Harry Pasternak. And so, so in walks a guy named William Goad. William Goad is, he's the director of a local bank. He owns Goad's Hardware. He's over on Eloquent Square. He's a big time business guy. He is on many boards and many committees for the city. He's a you know, part of the planning committee. And, he actually owns part of Harry's debt. And as a matter of fact, there are a dozen claims that, that are looking for Harry. Harry owes everybody money, so they begin foreclosure procedures. And so these dozen people get together and they have a problem. Harry doesn't own the lake. Bella owns the lake. And what did Bella do with the lake? Bella disappears. She evaporates. They can't find her anywhere. She goes and she actually quit claims the lake to some guy named Earl in Buffalo, and uh, he quit claims it to his wife. And so now it's three three owners down, <laughs> down, down the road, they, they had nowhere to foreclose. And so the courts uh, appoint a receiver uh, for this to kind of keep business going while they, they figure this out. Eventually, they, they get after Harry. Harry goes, he retrieves the lake, and he ends up uh, 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 being foreclosed upon. And William Goad uh, now owns the lake. And go by foreclosure. And so there's a little dirty dealing going on here, too. There's a lot of rumors flying around, it's almost viral in the Batavia area, because there are so many people that are looking for money. They actually went to the court and they said, if you'll give it to William, we'll drop all of our. So, so I think that William probably bought them out, you know, made some kind of an agreement there. So, anyway, so he owns the lake in 1929. William Goad had a daughter. Her name was Gladys, Gladys Goad. Gladys fell in love with a guy named Roger Bomber. <laughs> Marries Roger Bomber, and William Goad in 1935 gifts Horseshoe Lake to Roger Bomber as part of her wedding gift. And so that's how the Bomber get Bomber. That's so the Goad family and the Bomber family. So at this point, Roger Bomber, he's, a, he's an educated guy. He's got a degree. He's a, quite an accomplished musician. He is the church organist in the area. He's a, a speaker a number of places. I think I've heard a number of stories from people that he was involved in so many different activities. He champions children's causes. He's got a long-running deal with Leroy um, Town where they would bring bust the kids in three times a week for them to take swimming lessons. <laughs> And, uh, and so he's, already, he's a real champion of that. 
tragically, and so he starts to transition the, 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 the entire leg from this amusement park atmosphere to a quiet cottage style community. Well, this is going on. Tragically, he took a swim every night, and tragically, in 1968, he, he drowns in Horseshoe Lake. So the Bombers, they formed the Horseshoe Lake Corporation in 1970, and that's who owns the lake now. So in terms of this, William Go manned the lake for six years. Roger Bomber managed it for 33 years. His estate managed it for two. The Horseshoe Lake Corporation managed it for 53 years, which means that the single family has actually been owned and operating Horseshoe Lake for 94 years. And that kind of brings us up to date. Now, Horseshoe Lake was originally created as a solution to a, biz a business problem. It has been a business ever since. It's been many different kinds of business. It's been an amusement park. It's been a picnic ground. It's been a, um, a place where cottagers can buy, they, they can buy your cottage, which can't buy the land. You have to lease the land from, from the bomber. So it's, it's, Horseshoe Lake is a business. It's a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful community. And if you get a chance to come down there and take a look, you should do it. Now, just let's talk about the bombers for a second. So this is the aerial view, current aerial view of this. And so the bombers own the lake, of course, 67 acres. They also own this 28-acre parcel. They also own this 8-acre parcel. They also own this 19-and-a-half-acre parcel. They own this 26-acre parcel. And they also own this 11-and-a-half-acre parcel. And so they own about 160 acres surrounded of the lake and the surrounding areas. And so I think what, you know, they're trying to do two things. One, they're renting this property to the farmers for them to grow their crops, and so they're making a couple of bucks on that. But they're also trying to protect the lake from encroachment because there's a, a number of different businesses that might be encroaching on the lake. Yeah. So that's what it looks like today. check out the rest of the museum at the same time. Uh, and we, uh, our next trivia for July, so July 14th, will be on the Battle of Gettysburg since it is uh, an an a major anniversary this year, a 160th anniversary of the battle. So we test your knowledge on Gettysburg. And then our next guest speaker will be uh, the 19th of July, uh, and it will be Grant and Lincoln in full costume. So, uh, some very good reenactors who do uh, very good uh, Grant and Lincoln, and play uh, look the part very much so. So, uh, if you want to uh, come to that, that will be uh, Wednesday, July 19th at 7 p.m. So, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank